how do we know that the different types or the different um, uh, ingredients in the, the vaccines are safe? Um, specifically when we talk about AstraZeneca, there's been lots of controversy around that specific vaccine. I haven't specifically looked at the AstraZeneca formulation myself, so I can't really comment um, in, in detail on that. But, you know, uh, there, again, you know, um, you, when you are designing a formulation, you have criteria that you have that you want to meet. You, want, you have some performance characteristics you want, that you want the, the, the drug product, whatever it is, to meet as, as term, in terms of the formulation. And it depends too, in some cases, on how you're going to use it, the route of administration, all of those are factors in how you, what you're doing when you're developing a formulation. But the actual components are pretty critical and some are, are you know, have different um, risk factors associated with them in terms of um, some of the risks that people might be concerned with. And one that was, that's been very, very common for um, quite a number of years now is concerns around um, effects such as um, Chrysler Jacob disease, and that would be, you would be looking for things like um, materials that have origins from animal in origin materials or you know, um, things like that that would um, confer risks for disease like that. So those are some of the things that you look at in your formulation to make sure that, that you're, um, you're not adding those risks that you're already, or that you're controlling them. If, for example, if you're using materials that have sources like that, there are processes that you would go through to inactivate. It's really, it's, you're looking for, uh, you're looking basically at um, eliminating prions that can actually be active in your product. So you're looking at ways of inactivating it so it doesn't cause you any risk in your product. But you know, in, the, in that vein, you know, it's a kind of a similar approach. You're looking, it's, you're doing risk management. You're doing risk all along the way. You're, you're constantly um, assessing risk of um, inputs into your process, inputs into your products. So that's basically, and everybody, and they, again, you know, those things are sort of, um, built into the process now because we've seen where the risks come from a long time ago and you build those in. The only thing I would say is that um, the, the, two, the two, two first vaccines that we have, because of their, because they're, it's a new platform and it's a, somewhat unique in terms of um, where we are in terms of vaccines at this point in time. And you can well imagine them, um, everybody's eyes were on these two first vaccines and in terms of the follow-up that Upton referred to, even the CDC, were quite clear that this was the most rigorous follow-up they've ever done on any vaccine product. If I may uh, chime in there, I think you ought to remember that whereas in a clinical trial, you're dealing with 40,000, 30,000 numbers, we now have real life experience with these vaccines where millions probably we're reaching hundreds of millions have received the vaccine. So if there's a very rare event, like one in a million, that you may not have seen during the clinical trial, you will probably see it in the real life implementation. And so the reference of the question was to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So in the UK, after vaccinating nearly 17 million people, they saw a few incidents of blood clots. So that was a signal. But to assure people that the system is working, it was not overlooked. People identified it. And in fact, actually, there were decisions to suspend the vaccination momentarily to allow them to look into the connection between the AstraZeneca vaccine and these incidences of blood clot. That's to assure the public that the system is working. And in fact, in many jurisdictions, they've decided how to redeploy the AstraZeneca vaccine because of those observations. So the public should be assured that as millions and millions and millions of people receive these vaccines, we're going to see signals of very rare side effects or adverse events which happen with every medication and every vaccine. So that is not to say that one should shy away from these vaccines, but it is an awareness that one should have and an assurance that the system is working to identify these very rare reactions to the vaccine. So, so Neb, can I add to that? I agree again with everything that uh, Isaac and, um, and Trevor have said. Um, 
uh, one of the things that I've been personally impressed with is, um, is how transparent the um, manufacturers of the, uh, these vaccines have been with respect to the ingredients. And, and in fact, the, what's in the vial is really quite simple. Um, and there, there's some differences, but the most important thing is that there's nothing that's in the vaccine vial that is not labeled, that there's nothing hidden, it's all there. And, uh, and in, in gross terms, it's actually for the mRNA vaccines, it's actually quite simple. It has the mRNA, it has um, uh, a lipid, it has uh, some other chemicals, um, one of which is, uh, has been alluded to by Trevor called um, polyethylene glycol, it's used in cosmetics and bowel preps and laxatives. It has sugar, water, and some salts. It's really quite simple. Um, and I often think of it as um, like having a raisin uh, this is for the mRNA vaccines, having a raisin that is coated by chocolate, where the, where the lipid is, is coating this mRNA product. The other vaccines, um, for example, AstraZeneca, uh, is not, it has a little bit more, but it's, it's not very different in terms of um, the transparency of what's in the vaccine, in terms of the chemicals um, um, and sugar and water and and salt, uh, polysorbate, um, ethanol, um, histidine. These are, these are uh, various chemicals that have been used and are being used in various medications. Key take home point though, is that there's nothing that's in those vials that is hidden.